morning once again. I'm Pastor Laura, and I serve as the Executive Pastor of Operations here at Broadway. Although I have to tell you that a lot of the times I get confused as being one of the youth in the youth group. You know, I, I kind of think it might be the height. So I think that might be it. But in all actuality, I've actually been on staff here at Broadway for almost 10 years now. It's hard for me to believe. Um, but I've got to tell you guys that I am still just as excited about our shared mission of invite, grow, and serve as I was the very first day that I started here, if not more so, actually. It is such an honor to get to love God and to love people alongside you. And it is such an honor to get to be here with you this morning to share with you from God's word. Last week, we started together a new sermon series called Eyewitness. And so that kind of got me wondering, how many of you have, have actually ever been an eyewitness to an accident or, or some kind of incident? Anybody here? Yeah, quite a few of you, right? When you're an eyewitness, you're a pretty valuable resource to the police, aren't you? They can come and they can talk to you, and you're able to give them a perspective that perhaps no one else has. You know, as they get to talk with all of these different people, they're able to give them bits and pieces of information that perhaps no one else was able to see. And so it's not that all of these different accounts that they, they gather up are in conflict with one another, but rather that all of these different accounts work together in order to help them get a clearer, more accurate picture of what really occurred. And the same thing is true as we come to the scriptures, trying to understand the incident of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. There were many eyewitnesses to this event, people who got to watch what was happening up close and in real time, and if we will take the time to, to kind of step back and to look at what was happening from all of these different perspectives, what we'll walk away with is, is not only a clear understanding of, of what this event was all about, but also a deeper sense of how it is that God wants to work through this event to transform our lives. And so that's what we're trying to do in this sermon series. We're trying to take the time to look from all these different perspectives particularly the perspectives of some of the more minor characters that we might not have really spent time with before. And so last week, we spent time with Caiaphas, the great high priest who has been said to have played the greatest single part in putting Jesus to death on the cross. He was a man who had power and prestige and position, and he was willing to do whatever it took to hang on to those. But today, we turn our attention to a man who had none of those things. A man named Barabbas, who had actually tried to take those very things by force. We first meet him after Jesus has already been on trial by Caiaphas, the high priest, and the other religious leaders that came together and were called the Sanhedrin. They had examined Jesus, and they had found him guilty of the crime of blasphemy. But they had one problem. They didn't have the authority to put Jesus to death. And so the religious leaders, they took Jesus to the one man who did have that power, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. Now from the start, Pilate, he didn't really buy the story that the religious leaders were giving him. He really didn't think that Jesus was trying to overthrow the Roman government and set himself up as king. He thought that the religious leaders had something up their sleeve. But the religious leaders had a trump card, a trump card that they were, were very quick to play. They reminded Pilate, and this is in the Gospel of John, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be king opposes Caesar. They had a point. And so Pilate, he was kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. As much as he believed that Jesus was innocent and had done nothing wrong, as much as he wanted to let him go, at the very same time, he couldn't come off as weak against his boss's enemies or he would be the one heading to the execution block. And so what was he going to do? He thought about it, and he decided, you know what? 
I'm going to let the crowd decide. You see, all of this was taking place in the middle of the Passover feast, the one time a year where where people, Jewish people from all around, would come together in Jerusalem to celebrate how God had brought them as a people out of slavery in Egypt. And so it had become customary during this time of celebration of how God had set them free for the Roman governor to give them a choice, a choice between two prisoners so that one of them could go free. This particular Passover, Pilate gave the people this choice. Who do you want me to release to you? Jesus, this one who they're calling the Messiah, or this other prisoner? This other Jesus, actually, Jesus Barabbas. We honestly don't know very much about this other Jesus. Inside In fact, outside of the Gospels, we have no other historical record of his life. And so all that we know is that the Gospel of John says that he was a robber. And then what Matthew, Mark, and Luke all add is that he was also a murderer who had been a part of an insurrection at some point. In other words, Barabbas had been a part of a group of people who actually had tried to overthrow the Roman government using violence and force, that they had failed. And Barabbas had been caught, which meant that he was as good as dead. You don't get to attack Rome and get to keep your life. It was certain that he would be put to death for this crime until early that Passover morning when Pilate thrust him in front of the crowd. Suddenly, there was this glimmer of hope, this glimmer of hope that he might go free because now his fate was in the crowd's hands. Now, as we're going along in this story, we might think that the crowd's choice should be pretty clear, right? Here on one side, you have Jesus, who is a teacher and who is clearly not guilty of anything. Right? And on the other side, you have Barabbas, who is blatantly guilty in his crime. Surely the crowd is going to choose to set Jesus free. But crowds can be tricky, can't they? We've all been a part of a crowd. You're actually kind of a part of one right now, right? And it's very interesting what happens when we as human beings get together into groups. There's actually a whole strand of psychology that studies this. It's called crowd psychology or mob psychology. And there are all of these different theories that try to explain why it is that we do what we do. You know, why is it that we'll stand up and do the wave at a ball game when we really don't want to? (laughs) Why is it that we will start clapping along? Why is it that we will stand up every time a bell is rung, even when we're not told to do so, you know? But we're in a room, and the bell rings once, and one person stands up. And then the bell rings again, and a few more join in. And then the bell rings again, and suddenly all the room is on their feet. That was a real experiment that someone did. But more serious than that, why do we get into groups of people and at times do terrible things? Terrible things that we would never even consider doing all on our own. This past week, I was reading through all of these different theories, trying, trying to understand why we do what we do. And at some point, it struck me. At the heart of, of so many of these theories, sometimes very complicated and complex theories, I might say, there seems to be this very basic desire that is often at play. A very basic desire that motivates us to want to um, do what we do in the midst of a crowd. And that basic desire is this, the desire to people please. It's a desire that I have to tell you, it's not all bad. This desire to please others, it can help us treat others with honor and dignity and respect. But like any other desire in our lives, it can get off kilter at times. This desire, it can get out of control when we become willing to do whatever it takes to meet this desire in our lives, 
to maybe even compromise who we truly are and what we believe because somehow this desire, it has become the measurement by which we evaluate our worth as a human being. I have to tell you all this morning, I struggle with people pleasing a lot. I struggle with people pleasing in the crowd of my family. I struggle with people pleasing in the crowd of the church. I struggle with people pleasing in the crowd of my community. It is so easy for me to begin finding my value in what other people think of me. It is so easy for me to begin assessing my worth based on the amount of applause or criticism that I receive. And so it is so easy for me to start acting and reacting out of this desire to please. In fact, I'll never forget the very first time that I realized that this had gotten out of kilter in my life. I was in the fourth grade at Longest Elementary School in Powderly, Kentucky. If you know where that is, come and see me after the service. I'll give you a prize, okay? It's a very small place. Um, But on this particular day, we were out at recess. And um, on our playground, we had all the normal fun equipment. You know, we had swings and slides and seesaws. But then over on the other side of the playground, we had this big open field where people can just play whatever game they decided to make up. And so on this particular day, I was over on the swings, just having a good time. But suddenly I heard a commotion going on over in the field. And so I had to know what was happening. And I started moving that way. And as I got closer, I realized that a bunch of my classmates, they had kind of gathered up in a circle over there. And I got even closer, and what I noticed that was that one of my classmates was actually inside the circle. And he was running around breathlessly, chasing something. I wasn't sure what it was. Until finally, I looked down at his feet, and I realized that it was one of his shoes. Somehow, his shoe had fallen off. And now my classmates were doing everything in their power to keep this shoe away from him. They were throwing it from one person to another and running around laughing. And I was watching all this, you know, watching the shoe zig and zag all around the circle, when suddenly I realized that the shoe was coming right toward me. My classmate, he started running at me as I reached out and I caught the shoe. I could see that he was exhausted. I could tell that he was frustrated, but much more than that, he was hurt. It looked like there were tears gathering up in his eyes. And as I looked at him, I wanted to give him his shoe. But my classmates, They were yelling my name. Laura, throw the shoe over here. Laura, don't give it back. Laura, give the shoe to me. And all the while, my classmate was looking right at me, wondering, would I be the one who finally gave him back his shoe? And I wish I could tell you that I did. But what I did was I reared back and I threw the shoe. I think about that moment quite often in my life. And some people might say that, you know, I just got caught up in the moment or got carried away with the crowd. But if I'm honest, there's something much deeper going on than that. Internally, what I knew was that I wanted to please my peers. I didn't want them to be mad at me. I didn't want them to think that I was a stick in the mud who couldn't have any fun. And I certainly didn't want to become the next classmate that was in the middle of the circle that they were taunting. I needed their approval to fuel my worth. And so in that moment, when I was standing there holding the shoe, I made a choice. I decided that I cared more about what other people thought of me than doing the right thing. In that moment, holding that shoe, I decided to act out of the desire to please rather than to act out of what I knew even as a fourth grade little girl, what God called me to. 
love, to love him and to love others as myself. And so I threw that shoe. What about you? When have you thrown the shoe? Perhaps you've been in the break room at work and all your, all your peers are talking about a certain coworker, they're putting them down. And when they finally turn and look at you, you add on some harsh comment because you don't want them to, to, to turn on you. You don't want to be shunned. Maybe you've seen that all your friends are on, on Facebook, they're, they're, they're shaming someone publicly. Maybe it's someone you've never even met before, but you add on some ugly comment into the conversation, into the hopes that your friends will push that like button and affirm your value at that other person's expense. Perhaps you've been with a group of friends when someone has told a degrading joke about another gender or race or nationality and you've chuckled right along because you wanted to fit in. Or maybe you've seen someone or a group of someone's in our community being mistreated and you didn't directly join in, but out of your fear of conflict, you've given approval to what's going on by making the choice to turn and to look the other way. You know, as adults, I think we like to think that, that at some point we grow out of people pleasing, that at some point we become immune to peer pressure in our lives. But that couldn't be further from the truth. We just move on from the playgrounds of the world to the boardrooms and the break rooms, the, the barber shops and the back porches, where we feel the very same pressure to play the very same people-pleasing game. I've got to wonder, how many people in that crowd that day, standing before Jesus and Barabbas, were feeling the pressure to play the game? I wonder how many of them had never even seen or heard of Jesus before, and they really had no stake in the outcome. I wonder how many of them actually had seen Jesus, and they were feeling internally conflicted because when they had seen him and heard him, it sure seemed like he was doing a lot of good. I wonder how many people in that crowd that day knew without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus had done nothing wrong. Certainly nothing to warrant death. But yet when Pilate turned to that crowd and he asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? The crowd shouted together, Barabbas, 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 over and over and over again. We know from the, the gospel of Matthew for a fact that the chief priests and, and the elders, that they had persuaded the crowd to reply in this way. They would have been the, the well-respected and very visible leaders of the people. And they certainly would have been much better well-known and trusted by, by the Jewish people who had come from afar for the feast that week. Perhaps the crowd thought together, who are we to question our leaders? We certainly don't want to be at odds with them. Or maybe they looked around at their peers and they saw them starting to chant and they thought to themselves, well, I better go along with that. <laughs> you know, I don't want to stand out or be criticized. I wonder how many of them were like me that day when I was standing there holding that shoe. And in that moment, they made the choice to care more about pleasing people than doing the right and loving thing. Here's what I want us to think about. What if Jesus had made that same choice? What if on that day when Jesus was standing there before that crowd, in that moment, he cared more about pleasing people than doing the right and loving thing? As a very experienced people pleaser, I feel like with some authority, I can tell you what he would have done. Jesus would have been trying to stop the shouting of the crowd so that he could defend himself. Jesus would have been doing everything he could to convince people that he really had just been, been misunderstood. He would have been doing everything he could to justify his words and his actions to the crowd so that they could see that he really was pleasing and good. But Jesus 
He did none of these things. In fact, the Gospels are all in agreement that as Jesus stood before that crowd that day, he did not utter a single word. He stood there in silence while this mob of a crowd roared, shouting someone else's name. Surely, as Barabbas was standing there, this stark contrast between Jesus and the crowd could not have been missed by him. He was getting this front row seat, watching all of this unfold. And my guess is, he wasn't all that surprised by the behavior of the crowd. Maybe their choice of him, but he knew how crowds worked. Remember, it was being a part of a crowd that had grown so angry that it had spilled over into violence that had landed him in this position in the first place. He knew what crowds were capable of. However, what had to be absolutely perplexing to him was the behavior of Jesus. This one that they were calling the Christ, the king of the Jews, who was not trying to placate or please the crowd even one little bit. I wonder if he looked at Jesus and he thought, what's wrong with this guy? He's just being passive and weak. But what Barabbas And the crowd did not know was that behind closed doors, Jesus had already acted out of great wisdom and great strength. What Barabbas and the crowd did not know was that Jesus was standing there in confidence because he had already said what he needed to, to the right person, at the right time, in the right place, for the right reason. What they did not know was that Jesus had already set everything into motion so that he could do the right and the loving thing. Here's what had happened earlier. Away from the crowds, Jesus had spoken to Pilate directly. And Pilate asked him this question, are you the king of the Jews? And all Jesus had to do was say no. All he had to do was appease Pilate and assure them that that he wasn't an enemy of Caesar. But Jesus refused to give the pleasing answer that most likely would have set him free. And instead, he boldly replied, you have said so. In other words, he affirmed these charges that were being brought against him by saying, yes, you're right. I am their king. It is as you say. As we read through those words, we might not realize just how weighty this admission was. Because what we have to understand is that if Jesus would have spoken these words any earlier in his ministry, when these crowds of people had been following him around, if Jesus would have admitted to them any earlier, yes, I am the Messiah. Yes, I am the one you've been waiting for. Yes, I am your king. Do you know what those crowds would have done for him? They would have taken up arms right then and right there to fight for him. They would have taken on the powerful army of Rome to put Jesus on his rightful throne. No question and no doubt, the crowds, they would have died for Jesus. But here's the thing. Jesus had come to die for them. He had come to do so much more than just lead a revolt that might set one little nation free from some foreign enemy. No, Jesus had come to to take on an enemy that, that all people were encountering. To take on the ultimate enemy of sin and death that was enslaving all of humanity. And so away from all the crowds that day, when they could not rush in to his aid, Away from all the crowds that day when it was too late for him to be saved, he finally spoke the words that the crowds had been waiting to hear him speak. Yes, I'm the one they've been waiting for. Yes, I am their king. You see, Jesus, he wasn't worried about pleasing that crowd that day because he loved them far too much for that. Whether Jesus wanted to do what he knew was going to bring them life. 
even though he knew full well it was going to cost him his own. Willingly and compassionately, he died for those crowds that were shouting someone else's name. Willingly and compassionately, he died for the Roman soldiers who would have fought against the crowd if they had decided to revolt. Willingly and compassionately, he died for Pilate, whose life would have been in danger if he had walked free. Willingly and compassionately, he died for Barabbas, this one watching all of this unfold up close, and whose life would have been taken if Jesus had not taken his place. Willingly and compassionately, out of love, Jesus died for all of them, and he died for all of us. John Ortberg, um, a pastor and writer, he explains this way. He says, it is as if Jesus said, I will lay down my life for people who do not understand. That can buy a little time. That can buy a little space so that a community can be formed. And out of sacrificial love, it can change the world. Hear that again. So that a community can be formed. And out of sacrificial love, it can change the world. You and I, we are a part of that community that Jesus died to create. And he has placed us here in the midst of the crowd of this world, not to try to please or placate, but rather he has placed us here in the midst of the crowd of this world to follow his lead to join him in transforming absolutely everything by being willing to stand up and to stand out, by being willing to choose in, in the big things and in the very small to do the right and the loving thing, by being willing to lay down our lives over and over and over again so that others can experience the hope and the freedom that our God gives without restraint. Honestly, you and I, this community, we're not always going to get that right. God knows that I don't. But what I want to invite us to do today is to come before God and ask him to be at work in our lives and in our shared life together to help us be that kind of sacrificial community that Jesus died to create. And so we're going to begin, first of all, um, as I guide us in prayer, by asking to, to truly experience and embrace God's love in our lives. Because here's the thing. If we really begin to experience the love of a God who is willing to die to set us free, then we don't have to find our worth in pleasing others anymore. Because we already know that we are fully accepted and completely loved. And so we're going to pray to help God experience his love, and then we're going to ask him to search our hearts. We're going to ask him to show us those places in our lives and, and even in our community life together where we have been choosing to do the pleasing rather than the right and loving thing. We're going to confess those things to God, and then we're going to receive his forgiveness and, a, and his grace so that we can go from this place ready and equipped and empowered to live out of love like Jesus did. And so if you would now join me in prayer, I'd like to ask you to put your hands, palms up in your lap in a position ready to receive. And let's pray together. Lord God, we come before you now trying to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love that you have for each one of us. God, we'll admit to you it's really hard for us to imagine how fully and how completely you love us. And God, it's really easy for us to think that we just, quite frankly, aren't worthy of such extravagant love. But God, in these next moments of silence, would you speak to us and assure us of your love in our lives?
now if you would turn your palms down toward the ground. Lord God, we desire to love you and others the way that you love us. But God, sometimes we miss the mark. As individuals and as a church, we can find ourselves being motivated by pleasing others rather than acting out of love. Search our hearts, God. Show us where we are operating out of fear, out of fear of disappointing people or fear of conflict or fear of rejection, whatever fears might be fueling our desire to please. God, show us those places where pleasing others has gotten out of control in our lives so that we can release them to you today. And now if you would turn your hands back up, ready to receive. Lord God, would you fill now those places in our lives once ruled by fear and the desire to please with your forgiveness and your great grace. Empower us, God, by your Holy Spirit to live a life that is ruled by the desire to love like you. We pray this in the name of the one who willingly laid down his life for us in love, Jesus Christ. Amen.